Good morning, church. Good morning. Um, let's be waiting for this time of worship. I greet you in the name of the Lord. The Lord be with you. And also with you. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And abounding in steadfast love, the Lord is good to all, and his mercy is over all that he has made. All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and all your saints shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power to make known to the children of man your mighty deeds and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your and your dominion and and does throughout all generations. The Lord is faithful in all His words and kind in all His walks. Please stand. The King of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain my journey from, oh, he is my song. Let the King of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life, oh, he is my song. You are good. some of our LTC song leaders and Bonnie was our first one this week and um, we got things kind of messed up so we got to go back and do kind of the welcome so welcome church it seems like it's winter again um, we want to also welcome our guests and we have friendship bread for them so if I could get Jory and Marshall. Marshall Marshall to come on up and if you're a member would you please look around and make sure that all of our guests get a loaf of friendship bread. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
And yes, there is a QR code on the bulletin that you can scan and get more information about our family here at Oak Ridge.
guilt in mind, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me, from life's first cry to final breath. Jesus commands my destiny, no power of stands out to me. It's an old one, but every time I hear it, I'm, I don't know, there's something about it that really speaks to me, because I feel like in our Western world, in our Western way of doing church, for a lot of us, for a long time, it's, all, it's always been about us and our faithfulness and our faith in Christ, and there's something about that song that really flips that around. Great is thy faithfulness. How faithful God is, to, and Jesus is to us. Because there's all these things that are, he's doing in our life. And primarily it's him that's changing our world. Right. And I love that song. And I, I think, I just wanted to point out because global prayer time is all, is all about focusing on Christ's faithfulness to the world. Amen. And uh, what a great song to, to go before. If you guys have been following uh, the Ramadan prayer challenge, uh, Ramadan con uh, concluded Friday, I think it was Friday, where they uh, did the Eid, the great, the feast. Uh, when they break their fast, they all feast together and celebrate and pray together. Um, I've been thinking about Ramadan a lot, and I kind of want to go on my own fast. And, so I'm wanting to do that this week, but uh, thinking about that a lot has impacted me and the faithfulness of Christ, praying that the faithfulness of Christ affects people in the world uh, that I'm not in proximity with. <coughs> and just praying about these Muslim groups, especially this past Friday, um, I think it's been something really good to think about, and I want to invite you guys in this conclusion of the prayer challenge to <coughs> think about Christ's faithfulness in those that don't even believe. Uh, that this whole idea of Ramadan, this focusing on God, listening for God, uh, I, I would love to invite you guys to pray with me about allowing their open ears for Christ to come in. That's so important because there's so many people that are calling to God and it's my prayer and my hope that God speaks back to them and that Christ can enter their heart. And so if you would, bow with me in prayer and uh, go to God. Um, God, you know all of our hearts and you know the hearts of those that are calling to you. However it is they do, um, how, however it is they do it, uh, God, they are calling to you. The, the Muslim world has been calling to you and listening for you. God, allow their ears to be opened in this conclusion of their festival and of their, their, big, their, their prayer journey. Uh, God, allow their ears to be open to Christ. That families can hear his words and his, <laughs> and his deed, and they can come to know Christ's faithfulness to them before they even knew him. Uh, God, as we uh, meditate on what, as we have been meditating on what Ramadan means and how we can be challenged by that, 
walk and that uh, faith that uh, you put, you open up our ears and our minds to you and you allow, allow us to listen uh, regularly and God I just ask that you enter all of our hearts that listen to you uh, it's in your holy and blessed name and in your faithfulness that we live and that we thank you and that I pray Good morning. Good morning. It's the time in our service where we center our thoughts on Christ's sacrifice for us and partake of his supper and gather around his table. This morning, when I pulled into the parking lot, I was struck with pure terror. I, had, I was going to come into the 21st century and have all of this on my phone. And I reached for my Bible. Realized I'd left my phone on the bar at home. So I'm going back to old school. Those of you that know me from Azel Church, you knew I had notes anytime I did anything in front of the congregation or in a Bible class. I have notes. So this morning, Ron, thank you for asking me to do this. It's been a very long time since I've stood before a congregation and, and did anything. So I'm, I'm very thankful for this opportunity this morning. To me, this time is a time of conflicting emotions. It's a time of sorrow, sadness, and guilt. But at the same time, it's a time of amazing joy and thankfulness. You may ask me why sorrow? And I'm sorry because our Lord had to suffer so dreadfully for my sins and the sins of the world. Why sadness? I'm so sad that he had to do it so much alone. So many of his followers and disciples deserted him on that day for fear of what the Jews would do to them. Even Peter denied him three times on the eve of his sacrifice. But worse, worse than that, his own father had to forsake him. His holy father forsook him because he took on our sins and God couldn't abide with sins. So it's a time of real sorrow and sadness for me. But then I'm reminded immediately that that's the reason his love for us is the reason he did it. He loves us so much that he suffered that. He gave up all that glory in heaven and came down and suffered the way he did because he loved us and he wanted us to be with him in heaven someday. But, you know, it's just so, such a serious time in our service that we do this. It's one of the main reasons we come together on the first day of the week. He commanded us to do this in remembrance of him. So as we prepare our minds here, I want to read a few verses, and they're very short verses. First of all, Luke 23 and 34, and I want you to think about Jesus. He's hanging on the cross in all of these verses, and these are six statements that he's made from the cross. The first one is Luke 23, 34. He looked up to his father and he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He forgave those who tortured him. He forgave those who nailed him to that cross and put him to death. And he asked his father to forgive them. He will forgive us. Luke 23, 43. I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. He was talking to one of the thieves that were crucified next to him. That thief had defended Jesus because the other thief was uh, rebuking Jesus and making fun of him and telling him to save us all if you're the son of God. And this other thief said, 
we deserve this for our deeds. This man has done nothing wrong. And he asked Jesus to remember him when he came into his kingdom. And that's when Jesus said, I tell you the truth, today you'll be with me in paradise. So he forgave the, the people that had been put to death rightfully. John 19, 26 and 27, he's looking down and he sees his mother. It's one of the few that stayed with him. And he saw his beloved disciple, John. And he says to Mary, Woman, here is your son. And to John, here is your mother. And from that day forward, John took Mary into his home and looked after her. So he was thinking of others. He wasn't thinking of himself. He wasn't thinking of his pain and his sorrow. He was thinking of others. Matthew 27 and 46 and also in Mark 15, 34, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is the one that breaks my heart, knowing that his Holy Father had to turn his back on him at that moment. John 19 and 30, Jesus says, it is finished. Finished has two meanings in this verse. First of all, it means Christ has finished the work that God gave him to do to bring about our salvation. It also means, it's the same word that means paid in full. He paid a debt he didn't owe. He paid the debt we can't pay. And it was paid in full once and for all. And the last one, Luke 23, 46. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. These statements that he made on the cross have been treasured by people that followed him for centuries. And it just shows what he went through, what he suffered to bring about the completion of God's plan of our salvation. He did it all for us. Would you pray with me? Oh God and Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity that we can come together and gather around your table to partake of the loaf which represents the body sacrificed on that cross for us and the blood shed for the remission of our sins, to wash away the sins in the past, in the present, and in the future. One perfect sacrifice once and for all. Thank you so much. It just demonstrates how much you truly love us. And I thank you for that love. And as we gather around your table, we ask your blessings on this as we partake of the loaf and partake of the fruit of the vine. And help us to do it with our minds and hearts centered on you. It's in your holy son's name, our Savior our King, and our friend, Jesus Christ, that we pray. <clears throat> For visitors, we have tables set up around the room. You're welcome to join us around those tables or in baskets in the foyer. There are individual um, pieces of the Lord's table, and you can do it privately or in your seats. Either way is acceptable. time we put up the QR code which will make it available for anyone who would like to make their offering online. There's also some boxes around the auditorium if you prefer old school methodologies. Those are fine. Um, so, uh, but uh, appreciate anything that you do and know that it will be put to the Lord's work. Uh, let's go on to the, to the next one. So this is a very special time for Oak Ridge. Um, never seen this done anywhere else. But, and one of the reasons that my wife and I decided to stay. This is a praying congregation. It's a congregation of the Lord's believers who actually believe that God interacts with the world when we ask him to. And so at this time, we're going to ask the shepherds and their wives to gather around the outside as we normally do. 
And for those of you who may not be aware of what this is, this is a time for us to ask for prayers, to seek God's favor, to seek God's intervention in our lives. It is a time when we can ask for God to intervene on behalf of others. It's a time when we can get up, and it's okay. This is normal for us to get up and go across the auditorium and pray for somebody. Or to go across the auditorium and ask a friend to pray for you. It doesn't have to be one of the shepherds, but it can be if you need them. And so uh, as the group sings, uh, let's pray to God and ask him for what we need. Please stand. I praise my soul, praise for for me too and uh, in, fa in fact what I always remember uh, I had a, my dad's sister who died fairly young at her memorial service um, we sang that song in Nolan High School Auditorium and uh, even in that moment uh, God is faithful and in the moments that we lift it up now God is faithful no matter the circumstances no matter uh, where we're at Father, we know you're faithful. We know that you hear the prayers of your children. 
God, increase our faith to trust in your faithfulness, that you carry out your will, that you keep your promises, that you hear the prayers of your children. Hear us now, Father, and answer in Jesus' name. Now it's time for our children to go to children's worship. And on their way, they'll make their offering uh, up here. This offering helps our friends in South Texas, our friends in Haiti. And we'll stand together and sing as they go out. for the last month I've been sitting every time I preach. We've wondered, but it seems like a personal question. I don't really know why. I'm honest. I, I thought about it about two weeks into it. Why do you keep grabbing that chair and sitting on it? I have no idea, but I am. I want to I wanna take a minute. to thank people who serve up here on a volunteer basis. You may or may not be aware of the fact that <clears throat> Abigail does our worship leading each week volunteer, and when she's not doing it, whoever is doing it is volunteering. And I, I, I realize that you probably, you know, if, you, if, if you're not constantly involved in that sort of thing, you probably don't just give it a second thought. I mean, it's just, you know, you, you would just expect it to happen. Yeah, it's just, that happens. I want you to know, it's, there are mornings when people who volunteer up here, when people who are going to sing on the worship team or, or do different things, there are mornings where they go, man, I wish I could just sleep in this morning. Amen. And they, <laughs> and they show up anyway early and they go through it um poor anna has on more than one occasion sat back there with a severe headache running the powerpoint for us because it's got to be done you, you guys get where i'm going with this yeah. i don't want to belabor it i just want you to know people love you enough they the the 15 minutes of fame on this stage are not worth it okay <laughs> It is not about their uh, fame or reputation. It is, it is an act of love, and I hope that you appreciate it. Now, I, on the other hand, get paid, so I'm happy to do it, even on the Sundays I want to stay in bed, which I have. I have those Sundays. 
Okay, those were lighthearted chuckles that make me second guess whether or not I should have said that. <laughs> we are doing a series this year on witnesses. I am trying to encourage you, Oak Ridge, to be witnesses. I am asking you to think about how you live in the world. And we're doing it by looking at the book of Acts. And we're thinking about what's going on as the church begins and grows and becomes a force that's literally going to change history. Things are going to happen because the church exists. Um, hospitals will come into existence. Uh, life will be changed for orphans and widows. Uh, slavery is going to end, at least in some parts of the world, because of the influence of the church. Can I get an amen? Yeah. I, I, I want us to understand that if we could jump in a time machine and go back and somehow stop the movement of the church, which we couldn't, not only do we not have a time machine, I don't think anything was going to stop the movement of the church. But even if we could, it would make all the difference. The world would not be the same. And I really encourage you to understand that. And to decide you want to be, or to renew your commitment to be part of that movement and part of the good that has happened in this world. We are witnesses of the good that Jesus Christ has done. Now, today, I wanna go into these two almost obscure stories in the book of Acts. And if you're, you know, if you're doing daily Bible reading and you hit these two stories, you kind of, you kind of read them and go, well, that's nice, and you move along. If you're of a certain generation, you hit the name Dorcas and you think about children calling each other names on the, on the playground. Do teenagers know, is Dork, is Dork still a word? It's a variation of nerd. Yeah, a variation of nerd, a Dork. When I was a kid, we called each other Dorks or Dorcases. And, and a, a Dorcas was a female Dork. <laughs> Only it was, it was worse than nerd because it wasn't just that you had an odd affection towards you know knowledge in academia it was that you were you were interested in it but you were too stupid to really understand it i mean dork or dorcas was a really bad it was a slur are you with me now set all that aside <laughs> Because in the language, in the languages of the Bible, Dorcas simply means deer, like the like the the animal that I want somebody to come shoot in my yard. Um, it 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 simply means the lovely woodland creature, as well as her Aramaic name. That's the Greek name. Her Aramaic name, Tabitha. And so, I think. It, it, Think about the fact, and, and here's where I'm going with all that. These, Dorcas in, the, in, the, in this story, she's the exact opposite of the kid who gets bullied on the playground. She is that wonderful human you went to school with that everybody knew and liked and loved because she was so good to everybody. Um, I met a young girl one time um, Christy Blackman, I don't know that she or her family will ever hear this, but I want, I want, to, I want you to get this picture in your head. Um, I honor her. We, we kind of made fun of her because she was a little naive, but she was the president of her class at Crowley High School when I was a youth minister. And I went up to to the school one day, back then, youth ministers could go eat lunch at the school with their, their teenagers. And I went up to the school to have lunch with kids. And I quickly figured out why Christy was the president of her class. 
Christy walked into the lunchroom every day. Some of you have heard me tell this story before. And she would go from table to table. Now, in the, in the 80s, I'm sure it hasn't changed because it was this way before, kids sat at tables by groups. Do you all remember that? And in those days, we had the jocks table. That was the people, an unfortunate name for athletes. And then, and then we had, in those days, there was a table of girls they called the angels of death. They were the goth kids. Are you with me? And they, they wore black fingernail polish and, and lipstick and black hair. Everybody dyed their hair black and their clothes were all black. And then you, you would have a table of, you know, the nerds, the, the academic achieving kids. And so I pointed at all of our brilliant children over there. And, okay, I only pointed over there because Kellen said nerds. That's, I was pulling that word from him. Um, <laughs> and then they... You know, there would, and, but in that lunch period, in Christie's lunch period, there was also a table full of kids who were from special ed. They were the Down syndrome and the kids who were, were from special education. And when Christie walked in the room, she went from table to table to table. She called people by name at every single table. And I stood and I watched her on more than one occasion as she would interact with and they would respond to her kindness. She wasn't doing politics. She was asking about their lives. She was just interacting with them. They were all her friends. And poor girl was skinny as a rail because she could not ever eat lunch, you know? Because she was in there caring for people. I'm trying to create a picture in your mind when we get to Dorcas because I want you to understand that Luke is telling us a story about someone who is so caring and so involved that the people around her are going to send for an apostle to come and pray over her and share in their grief. I don't even know whether they thought Peter could raise her from the dead. They just wanted him there because of their love for her and their grief. I know that for sure. And, and we have another man who barely, we barely know anything about this guy. But here's the deal. Peter is being Christy Blackman. The text that we're going to read is going to say that Peter is going from place to place. The Net Bible translates it place to place. But, but what the text, the Greek text actually says, and Peter was going through, through all, in order to meet the holy ones. And what, he's, what the text, what Luke is telling us, is Peter makes a decision. After the scattering after the, per the church is persecuted and people run for home, Peter's made a decision, I'm going to leave Jerusalem and I'm going to go house church to house church and just check on and connect with the holy ones, the people of God. And I'm going to move about. And so Peter is on this house church world tour and he's out there connecting with the people. And it's a powerful picture if you pause to think about it because there is no missionary society. There, there are no people with, with degrees. There's no church denominational structure and system. There's no setup where Peter is, you know, a visiting bishop from some head church headquarters in Jerusalem. None of that is what's going on here. Peter is simply saying, I believe by the leadership of the Holy Spirit, it's time to go and connect all of these people and make sure we don't lose connection to each other. And so he goes from place to place. Now, I threw a map together for you. 
So Peter leaves Jerusalem. He goes in his first story, he stops in Lydda. And then he's called to Joppa. And he's going to stick around in Joppa for a while. And Luke is certainly setting up for us a story that, that Gunner is going to preach on next Sunday that's going to happen <clears throat> because, and, and Peter is going to be in Joppa. They're going to come to get him, and he's going to go to meet with Cornelius and Cornelius' family. And all of that's a setup. I want to invite you, please, read Acts chapter 10 this coming week. Because you wanna, you're going to want to get that story well in your head because Gunnar won't have time to read the whole chapter um, in the sermon next week. But I want you to get that whole story in your head before you come. And so certainly part of what's happening in the passage is we're going to read today. Peter is, I mean, Luke is setting up this story for Peter. But Peter goes. Now, Lydda is about 10 miles inland. So it's a day's journey. It's a one-day journey. So when they send for Peter, he's going to go to Joppa in one day. It's, he's just going to move over there. And, and he's, going to, he's going to be there for the story. I wanted you to see how close that is. So Peter was traveling around from place to place. He also came down to the saints at Lydda. Um, when I was a kid growing up, we, we were taught to say to the adults in the church, brother so-and-so, sister so-and-so. Um, sometimes on Saturday mornings, my dad would get me up and say, um, we're gonna go over and visit Brother Kelly this morning. You wanna, you wanna go? You wanna go with me? And I would gladly give up cartoons to go and sit in Brother Kelly's garage and watch him rebuild car batteries. Uh, Yes, nobody does that anymore. And he would talk to my dad about stuff. And I, I didn't really understand what was going on. But I saw two men of faith interacting with each other. Brother Kelly was one of our elders. We, we had that phrase, brother and sister, and we recognized there was a spiritual sibling relationship. I think it was our version of what Luke is doing when he says Peter went to check on the saints, the holy ones, the people who had chosen to follow Jesus. I'd love for us to recapture that sense of connection with each other. And so he goes, and when he gets to Lydda, he found, finds a man named Aeneas. This is an interesting thing to me. Aeneas, the name, is a Greek name. So Aeneas is one of those Greek-speaking Jews who has chosen to follow Jesus instead of fighting the Jesus movement. Because in the book of Acts so far, we've had both of those kinds of Greek-speaking Jews. Those who fought against Stephen, those who fought against Paul, Saul become Paul, who would become Paul. And then we also have these Greek-speaking Jews who are following Jesus, like Stephen. And Aeneas is one of those. A man named Aeneas. This Greek name carries, uh, carries some history, but we won't go there. Who had been confined to a mattress for eight years because he was paralyzed. Anybody been confined to a mattress for a period of time? Um... I got to tell you, sometimes people ask me, how you doing? And I say, it's a great day because any day I get vertical is a good day. After spending a number of weeks flat on my back in a bed, I, I looked forward to any time I could get vertical. This man lay in bed paralyzed for eight years. And Peter walks up and says, Aeneas, Jesus the Christ heals you. Get up and make your own bed. I, I, I love the translation here. It, it, the Greek is get up and fold your bed. He, he's sleeping on essentially a futon, right? A, a, a mattress on the floor. And he immediately gets up 
And all those who lived in Lydda and Sharon saw him and they turned to the Lord. Now, I set this up by saying he's like one of those Greek-speaking Jews who follow Jesus. I don't actually know that. The text doesn't actually say he's a believer. In fact, the text calls him a man. And, and when we get to the story about Dorcas, it's going to call her a disciple. So it's entirely possible this man is not even a Jesus follower when Peter heals him. And Luke doesn't even tell us if he becomes a Jesus follower after Peter heals him. But he does tell us that many other people in the town turned to the Lord because they saw what Jesus had done for Aeneas. We don't have any more of his story. We don't know what his occupation was prior to being paralyzed. We don't know what his occupation is going to be post being healed. We don't know any more about this guy. And that's actually significant. So while this is going on, in Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha, which in translation means Dorcas, which in translation means deer. She was continually going, doing good deeds and acts of charity. At that time, she became sick and died. And when they had washed her body, this is how we prepare a body for burial. They placed it in an upstairs room. Because Lydda was near Joppa, when the disciples heard that Peter was there, they sent two men to him and urged him, come to us without delay. So Peter got up and went with them. Now, this time out, this is important because this does foreshadow next week's story. Please go read Acts 10. Peter is not going to be ready to go without delay in the next story. Peter needs a vision from God to get him ready to get up and go without delay. But in this story, Peter gets up and goes without delay. <clears throat> all the, uh, when he arrived, they brought him into the upper room and all the widows stood beside him crying and showing him the tunics and other clothing Dorcas used to make while she was with them. So we take this story as Luke is telling it as telling us and we put the pieces together. She's constantly doing good deeds. She's constantly doing good for other people. And they're showing Peter the clothing that she made. And so we begin to realize, we stop and think, we pause and we say, wait a second, what is Luke telling us? Luke is reminding us, and not by us, I don't mean all of his readers, I mean Oak Ridge. He's reminding us there is no Walmart in Joppa. He's reminding us there's no clothing distribution system. He's reminding us that in this day and age, in the time of Peter and Lydia, and excuse me, Tabitha, in this time, if people were going to wear clothes, somebody in the neighborhood had to sew and manufacture those clothes for them. And he's telling us that Tabitha is one of those people who made clothes for people who had no clothes. Luke is reminding us that Tabitha is one of those sheep. Jesus is going to say, I was naked and you clothed me. But Peter sent them all outside. These widows gathered around these people living on the margins, these people who were kept out of sight in uh, high society, these people Peter also sends outside. He's not here for a show. And he knelt down and he prayed. And after he prayed, he turned to the body and he said, Tabitha, get up. And I can't help but pick up on the fact that Jesus raises another little girl, a synagogue official's girl, and he, Jesus says to her, Talitha, kum, get up. In this, and because her name, because the, the word Talitha is little girl, but Tabitha, dear, 
sounds very, very similar. And Luke is trying to evoke in our minds these two stories, this healing of Jesus that's happening through Peter. <coughs> she opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up. And Luke doesn't tell us, did she sit up abruptly? Who's this strange man in my bedroom? He doesn't tell us, does she sit up slowly as it begins to dawn on her that, oh, rats, I was in the presence of God and now I'm back on earth? We don't get, we don't get the story. But he gave her his hand and he helped her get up. And then he called the saints and the widows. Sister Mary and Sister Elizabeth and sister whoever else was there. And he presented her to them alive. And this became known through all of Joppa. And many believed in the Lord. What we see is this setup that Jesus started in Acts chapter 1. And Brian's going to read it for us again at the close of the service. But we see the church has moved from Jerusalem to, to Judea, to Samaria. And now it is among the Greek-speaking Jews in the Gentile world. And the church is growing like leaven in a lump of dough. And it is spreading and it is moving into their lives. This is significant. So Peter stayed many days in Joppa with a man named Simon, a tanner. And I'll set this up for you, but leave the rest for, for Gunner. A tanner is a man who takes skin off of dead animals and turns it into leather. He's a man who weekly becomes ceremonially unclean to visit the temple or the synagogue. And he must go through, this is a man who must go through a ceremonial washing before he can go to temple. He has to quit work a day early so that he can have a 24-hour period to be clean before he joins the synagogue. And, and this is a man who has a way of making a living and he interacts with the Gentiles in the neighborhood and Peter goes and he moves into this man's house to share life with him for a while. So Simon, though he is only mentioned here and in the next few verses, is just another person <coughs> for whom we do not have a grand story. He's a person who somehow... Peter deems worthy of staying with, who becomes part of Peter's mission to connect the church. And as I'm, as I'm thinking about these stories, and I'm asking myself, what's the big lesson? What do we want to take away? I, I could certainly talk to you about being like Dorcas and doing good in the world. I could say, Come on, be a Tabitha and make, live the kind of life that will cause widows to gather around your dead body and weep for you. I could do that. That could be a lesson we could draw out of this lesson. I could talk about being a, a person of influence in the community. Maybe, maybe Aeneas was somebody significant. He had, a, he had kind of a royal name. It's, it's the name of a Roman hero, a founder a, before Remus and Romulus uh, founded Rome. He's, he's one of their ancestors, and he's, uh, that name is a significant name. Maybe that means something, and maybe he's an official in Lydda, and maybe he's got a serious position because certainly there's a reputation that, that he has that's enough to make word of his healing spread throughout the town. I don't know. Maybe I could make that lesson. Maybe I could say, be a person of such good influence. Get out in the world and be a leader, a world changer. And I could encourage you to do that. 
I thought about that. I, I thought about what is the lesson I want us to take, and the more I thought about it, the less satisfied I was with those thoughts and those ideas, and what I began to settle in on was, you are already Aeneas's in this world. You may not have influence over city councils or school boards, but you are already people of influence with the people you care for. And I began to think you are already doing good works in this world. You are already making a difference for people you interact with. Friday, I did a funeral. Every once in a while, James Plowman will call me from Galbraith Pickard and say, we've got somebody who's not a member of a church and they don't have a preacher and I can't cover being the celebrant at their funeral. Would you do it? And I said, yes. And I went and met with his, this man's daughters and we planned a service on Thursday and then I went Friday. And I, I quote the, you know, officiant, but the family invited a couple of friends to come and speak and one of them was former Weatherford Mayor Joe Tyson. Anybody here know Joe? Amazing man. And uh, Joe got up and he had written a poem about the man who had died and he read the poem and then he told stories and I'm not gonna tell you all the stories but I wanna say to you two things. One, the family told James or James's employee, Rachel, that that their dad was not a religious man and so they didn't really want a hellfire and brimstone come get come to Jesus kind of sermon at his funeral. Good. Well, I'm the right guy for that. <laughs> <clears throat> but Joe Tyson stood up and said, this man was not only a man of faith, it was his faith as he went through his bout with cancer that enabled me to get through my bout with the exact same cancer the following year. But the most amazing thing that he said about the man was this man was my barber for 50 years. This man we celebrated on Friday moved to Weatherford after he got out of the Marine Corps and went to barber school and became a hairstylist, there's a whole story behind that, in Weatherford in 1962, and he retired in September of 2022, 60 years later. People attended this graveside service, not just Joe Tyson, but people who had literally been getting haircuts from this man or giving haircuts beside this man for their whole careers. And what I want to say to you is, I, the, the man didn't darken the door of a church. I don't, know, I, don't, I, I don't know a whole lot about this man, but what I want to say to you is, to most people in Weatherford, he was insignificant and unknown. But to the people who constantly interacted with him, he made all the difference. Amen. To his family, to his two daughters, one of which he raised as a single father, he made all the difference. So what I want to say to you, and it's just a God thing that I did that funeral having already put this last slide together for this sermon. What I want to say to you is you are already part of this story. And what you have been doing and your faithfulness in doing it into the future makes you an exquisitely precious part of God's story. You matter to God and he is writing you into the story exactly the same way he is writing Aeneas and Tabitha into the story. 
You are part of this story. Now, that's the most eloquent I can be. I really think N.T. Wright is more eloquent. So I put this slide together before I even did the sermon. I mean, the, the funeral. Luke is right to draw our eyes down to the small scale and immediate. In case we should ever forget that these are the people who form the heart of the church. When I meet such people, N.T. Wright, former bishop of Durham over all of Great Britain, okay? N.T. Wright, when I meet such people, people like Aeneas and Tabitha, the quiet, unknown people, I greet them as what they are, the beating heart of the people of God. So I start the sermon by saying thank you to all of you who volunteer to make our services happen week to week. And I say to you that what you are doing, all of you, your role, your place in the story of God is so significant and precious to God. And the fact that Luke included these two stories and many more as we go through the book of Luke out of Acts, the fact that Luke included these stories is testimony to you that your contribution to the kingdom of heaven matters to God. You matter enormously to God. Pause with me for a minute and think about your place in the kingdom. As a community of faith and part of the body of Christ, we come before the throne room of heaven. We recognize the community of divine being that we call the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we say to you with sincere and humble hearts, thank you for making us part of your story. Father, may the people of God gathered here this morning or anyone who watches the video know that they have been written into not just the Lamb's book of life, but the story of God in this world. May we, Father, appreciate and honor every life with which we come into contact. May we understand the work of God in the people sitting next to us or across the room from us. May we know the power of simply being a child in the family of God. May we, Father, seek no greater honor than to be called your son or daughter to be used by you to be a blessing to any of your other children. We pray through Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, our friend. Amen. Amen. Brian. Acts 1, 6 through 8. When the apostles were all together, they asked Jesus, Lord, are you now going to give the kingdom back to Israel? Jesus said to them, The Father is the only one who has the authority to decide dates and times. These things are not for you to know. But when the Holy Spirit comes to you, you will receive power. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all of Judea, in Samaria, and every part of the world. And 
don't think this is scriptural, but, and that includes Texas. <laughs> you are dismissed.